Welcome everybody. We hey. are here. Hi, Eldad, hey, with boys. another podcast of the Data Engineering Show. That's the name of our show, right? The background. Yeah, it is. This, this is it. For starters, how about you to introduce yourselves? Uh, Kim, let's go with you first. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim. I uh, am a software engineer at GitHub. And uh, I've been at GitHub for um, almost two years now. And I'm working on the data platform team um, before Joining GitHub, I was helping building a small data warehouse for a nonprofit. Arvon, now it's your turn. Yeah, so hi, um, my name is Arvon Smith. I'm a product manager for data at GitHub, and um, I support data engineering, data science teams, a whole bunch of uh, sort of data focused teams internally. Um, I have a background in astronomy. So actually, previously, I was running a data archive on behalf of NASA for the Hubble Space Telescope in Baltimore. Um, and I before that, I was actually at GitHub. So I seem to like working at GitHub. This is my second time in the company. I was back at GitHub in 2013 for about three years as well. So I don't remember what data was like then. It wasn't as good as it is now. So don't ask me hard questions about that. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, so good. So we want to dive into, you know, the data world and what do you guys do? So let's start with sort of, just tell us about your data stack and the kind of challenges it's intended to to serve. Okay, I, I can I can start. Um, so our data stack at the storage layer, we use um, Azure Data Lake storage, and then we use um, Azure Hadoop and distributed service or inside. Um, for Catalog, we use High Meta Store for um, transform data, ingesting data. We use Airflow. We have um, People using AML for machine learning pipeline. Uh, for compute, we have Presto, Snap, um, Azure Data Explorer. And um, for BI, we have some custom tool for individual customer and like Product 360 that you'll hear more about later. Um, we have a more general tool like Looker and Power BI as well. And um, so that's a lot. We have a yeah. <laughs> Different things going on. and Maybe I should have asked what you don't have. S3, S3. No S3 buckets. Interestingly enough, though, I think you're, you're our first guest. We've done like, uh, I think, six episodes or so, so far. Most have been, all have been on, on AWS. I wonder, you know, if we can talk a little bit about sort of Azure. Were you always on Azure? Was there like, a, was there a transition at some point? Was AWS on the table? If you could share some, you know. The thought process there. So yeah, we used to be on AWS, and we make the move to Azure uh, recently. And um, during that move, which is not just moving from one cloud to another cloud, we're actually moving the kind of services that we use as well. On AWS, we we were operating um, hundreds of nodes on Hadoop cluster, and it costs a tons of money. When we moved to Azure, we actually use um, Azure Hadoop and distributed insights which manage all of that infrastructure for Hadoop for us. And we pay for service better than paying for the machine. So it's a lot better in terms of um, how much we pay to build for it. So, so yeah. And was it a complete transition as in your Azure only at this point? Or do you still keep both in uh, sort of a multi-cloud strategy? The whole data warehouse is fully operations and Azure right now. That was a big lift for the team. Who was who was the person who deleted the, the S3 bucket? Kind of when all the tests are passed and then like someone must have pressed the button, <laughs> right? Drop bucket, which probably still runs. Um, it's a terrifying moment, probably. <laughs> How long did the transition process take? There is a lot of transition that carry out. So we think we have a lot of things like transition tech. Um, like we may take a quarter and transition one thing and then keep everything else the same. And then every quarter we move uh, another products over. And um, I wasn't involved in the beginning, but I was involved in moving Airflow at the very end. Um, so yeah, I think moving Airflow, we took three months at least to, to move Airflow from operating on um, AWS to Azure. So I want to say it took over a year to move. I, I think it was it was a long time. Um, it was a big big lift. Yeah. Is uh, are all the mental scars healed by now 
from doing that transition. It's, it's, it's you know, people de- de- typically dread these things. Like it sounds tough. It typically is tough, but it seems you've, you've done it and it, it worked well. So, so kudos. Awesome. <laughs> Let's talk about the, all the people involved with data. If you could tell us how the data teams are structured, you know, which software teams deal with data, or are there data engineering teams, or they, you know, data science, and everything in between, we'd love to understand how that works at GitHub. Yeah, so we have um, a, a fairly uh, new structure, actually. So I'm going to talk about what we've just reorged to um, and talk maybe about why we've made that change. So we have a data platform team, which uh, encompasses sort of collection of um, data engineers that kind of the way we think about that, they sort of run the common fabric of the data warehouse. So if you are a team that wants to provision storage or, um, you know, some kind of infrastructure for your service, then they sort of build that paved path for provisioning compute storage, that kind of thing, um, role-based access control, that kind of stuff. That team also owns the BI experience, so the the tools that you would use to you know interrogate the warehouse to go and you know and self service kind of questions as a member of staff, and then we have a collection of what we call verticals. So these are teams that are sort of close to full stack in terms of the skills. So there's analysts, data scientists, data engineers, um, and and their managers, and they are focus typically on product areas. Um, so we have GitHub internally, the way that we build the product, the sort of strategy around the service that we're building is broken into a few different verticals. And so we have we have effectively data teams aligned with those. And then there are other data teams um, that aren't within this core unit. We're sort of a centralized data team for the company. There's other verticals that are outside so they're sort of more like satellite data teams maybe in revenue sales that kind of thing so they're specifically serving their customers who who have sort of different types of questions but so this is sort of i think an idea uh, that's been pretty hot recently the sort of data mesh idea so building products for a particular set of customers really owning that relationship and having sort of long-term relationship with those teams that you support um so we've been doing this without the reorg for about a year now and it's working pretty well and so we sort of fully embraced this model actually just just this like last week we've sort of finally kind of crossed the eyes and- i mean you're doing a lot of changes recently moving to azure reorging the reorging the data teams who i wonder what's next in terms of change well stability is my hope so um <laughs> you know i think we're part of the part of what we've been doing is kind of growing up the like reorging the structure to be ready for for sort of next level of growth of the business, I think. So there's a lot, you know, the demand for data is very high. And I think we've sort of found it a little bit hard to support some areas of the business traditionally. And so, you know, especially with a centralized data team, it can be hard to prioritize across the whole business. So now we're Mm -hmm. sort of saying, this is a team that's focused on this area of the business or the product. And if it needs more capacity, then it should go and get headcount and fund it that way. It sort of gives the us as a data team is a bit more of a logical sort of scaling unit. From a headcount perspective, so all the teams we now covered, all the people involved with data, how many people are we talking about? So in terms of sort of data engineering, um, data science, um, I think we're probably at about 35 or 40, not very big, um, I think, compared to other companies. That excludes all of the like people who store Git on file servers and like that's all completely separate so of course there's a whole sort of data infrastructure team a set of teams around running like large scale scale distributed git Mm -hmm. or the application servers all that stuff and in fact actually observability so sort of system observability is also separate from that so um so if you think about that Without without yeah. those headcount that that we're this sort of um, I think it's about thirty five maybe maybe forty now. So let's get back to the two of you. Uh, now that we've actually mapped out uh, the structure of, of all the people involved with data, back to you guys. What do you, how do you fit in with that role? So you, you know both of you have different sort of roles. Kim, you're you're an engineer, and uh, and Arvon, you bring sort of a product hat. So if you could elaborate on what you do within that. Yeah, so for me, um, have been on the data platform team from the beginning. So the, this reorg doesn't actually affect me at much. The service that we own and operate and support, uh, maintain or stay the same, pretty much the same for me. 
Got it. Can you share one of the sort of the recent projects that was sort of more memorable or exciting for you beyond transitioning Airflow to, to Azure? It's more of transitioning Airflow from one version to another version. So Airflow is an open source uh, product. So it's um, continuing being developing on and there's new features running now and we want to keep on top of uh, all the bug fixes. So uh, most recent projects for me was just Make sure that we have uh, April two point running within the you know the data platform team. What does how does the distinction between what a software engineer would do and what a data engineer would do? I think all of my team members are software engineer, mm-hmm. and we we consider ourselves a data engineer. We um, um, we solve any problem that our user have or come to us with um, from uh, operating the platform for them, helping them with figuring out how to integrate from one, the pipe, their pipeline from one uh, technology to another technology, or even build in new features to like, for example, Airflow, I've been building the backfield tools that open source um, don't have to solve the use case that we, we do have. And Arvon, let's get back to, uh, to your responsibilities. So, I sort of a bit of a weird product manager role, I would say. So we don't, you know, we we have lots of customers for data internally. Arvon, you're not weird. You're super cool. Come on, product manager. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, you're very kind. The, it's a bit of a mixed bag, honestly. So some, we do have some products that we serve customers with. So product teams, we have this um, service product called Product Three Hundred and Sixty, which is. Um, you know, is a thing we built with software engineers and data engineers, and that's sort of a data product that, that teams use internally um, to understand common um, you know, engagement metrics, acquisition, retention, um, churn, that kind of thing around uh, around how, how people are using um, different parts of GitHub the product. So sometimes there's sort of quite traditional sort of product work where it's kind of figuring out what we should do, managing that backlog, understanding what that product should do, what the customer is. But then there's also much more sort of general kind of work around, there's all these potential customers we could serve internally, who who where's the lowest hanging fruit, um, where should we, or where's the highest return on an investment? So we have quite a lot of autonomy about how we spend our resources. So we've got mm-hmm. you know 15 data scientists, what, what should they work on? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a really good question. And so sometimes, Sometimes I spend my time developing ideas with other teams, um, sort of getting work to the point where it's ready um, for a data scientist to go invest. Sometimes we are sort of doing speculative work. We think there's some potential here. Um, we should spend some time doing some R and D to mature an idea to then go to a product team and say, "Hey, look, we think we could, you know, use data to like." you know, supercharge your product in this way or something. And so there's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. It's, a, it's a pretty varied and I enjoy that. It's very interesting. How many, how many product, pure product manager, product people are there that have a data specific role? It's just me. Uh, so we're hiring. We just hired a second person. Uh, I'm delighted to say because it's there's a lot. So one PM to forty engineers is way off a good ratio from my perspective. <laughs> so mm-hmm. just hired two. So now you have high availability at least. So yes, <laughs> yes, yes. What about metadata, by the way? What's the like? What's the most amazing metadata you've been playing with? Like, I'm thinking GitHub. I'm thinking at best semi-structured. How does that turn into a, a Looker dashboard? Or what's kind of in, what's if you can share on the metadata side? Yeah. So um, we have a sort of collection of data streams that we put in the warehouse. So we have a thing we called Hydro, which is I think just Kafka, uh, you know, that that is streamed um, collection of services, write events there. Um, this is the sort of paved path. If you're a product team, you want to this particular part of the product, you want to instrument um, measure some behavior in the product. Then you you write an event uh, in the product. There's a sort of pretty good abstraction as a developer uh, in Ruby for writing there or in Go. You know, there's mature client libraries that developers use. And so anything that's in Hydro in this Kafka stream ends up in the warehouse automatically. And so then we've got, you know, query tools on top of that, Presto or or uh, or something else. And then there's a lot of, we do a lot of, you know, have a lot of DAGs that run and turn those into things that are more consumable. So, you know, I think of 
probably a good example of where we have to invest a lot. If you think about something like security scanning as a product, so I have a vulnerability in my project or Dependabot, that kind of thing, where there's some dependency that I have in my project and I want to be alerted if uh, you know there's some vulnerability. So we care a lot about how successful that product is and whether people are responding to those alerts and whether they saw them and whether they did anything, whether they resolved the alert by pushing new code. And so actually building a set of dashboards that a product team can use to make data-driven insights about how well the product's performing it was a lot of data engineering work to design those tables, to collect the right data and build, build a performant you know, data model that, 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 that they could query easily because you know, there's a lot of dependable alerts and there's a lot of vulnerabilities that get exposed and people get alerted to. So it's just, it's, it's actually a lot of work just to, you know, m- make a single part of the product you know, understandable for a product team. So yeah, that'd probably be a good example of a, a, a unique GitHub problem. Yeah. What are sort of the key architectural lessons learned? I mean, you know, when you did the lift and shift to, to, to Azure, probably huge uh, architecture redo in a lot of places. Uh, Kim, you talked about Hadoop and how, how you change your, your approach there. But sort of, sort of what are the kind of things that you don't miss with the old architecture and, and you're smarter about now? One of the big things that I don't miss is uh, operating EC2 instances. Uh, I don't like having to check to see if they're dead or alive and need to restart uh, or how healthy they are, how the disk space are, are like. Um, when we moved to Azure, we also adopt uh, Kubernetes in Terraform. So we use Terraform to deploy our infrastructure. We use Kubernetes to run our uh, containers. So it's a lot um, easier to bring up new container or deployment become easier. It's less downtime for our user. So yeah, those are the big, the two big things that I am really happy that we land on. Which data volumes are you? Were we talking uh, about at at GitHub? Forty, about forty storage account, and they range from a couple megabytes to a couple petabyte, um, and they different data set. So it really depends on the topic or the um, the kind of data that in the storage that determine how big they are. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we have a wide range of. Um, the data set there. One good example, the the hydro topics. Um, I think the most voluminous is about four billion events per day um, mm-hmm. that get that get written to the warehouse. Um, so just to give you an idea of, I think that's our biggest hydro topic. Pretty sure. What are some of the use cases that are more real time ish in nature that are running today? This is a satellite data team. So in the sense like this isn't us, um, but platform health would be a good example. So spam protection. Um, so those teams use these hydro events, you know, so very low latency sort of system events. Um, and and they are running, you know, their own ML algorithms on the fly um, to detect spammers and, you know, quickly remove them. So I think one of the things that I kind of think is pretty awesome about the GitHub experience is it's really rare to see spam. Um, and so that's amazing. So that team's incredible and they're just laser focused on, on keeping spammers off the platform. So that's a real, that's a real time thing. I I think also all the uh, stuff that, um, uh, sort of platform, other platforms teams do around uh, availability. And, you know, when we, you know, I think GitHub receives a lot of denial of service attacks still and stuff like that, but that's not, that's not our world. Um, but, but I think those are some some real time stuff that's pretty pretty important. It does sound like you know GitHub is there's a culture around being data driven. I mean, there's so many initiatives going around data. Data teams are embedded within different services. Is there any standardization of how to approach uh, becoming data driven within sort of a new service that's being launched or a new initiative, or is it all very different across different teams with their own analysts and uh, data people? I think this is part of um, part of the challenge of the work that we do. Um, so, you know, I think I'm correct in saying that sort of product operations as a concept is quite new at GitHub. So this idea of what should you do when you launch a new product, right? Like there's a playbook, like sort of due diligence. I mean, I think we're good at making sure the docs are in good state, but what sort of instrumentation should you do uh, in the product to measure 
success? What are, do you have success metrics? All that kind of stuff. I think actually GitHub is getting much better at that, um, but that's not a historical strength, I think. Um, so I think there are playbooks now. I, you know, we built services that are, so this product 360 uh, service that we built, really you, all you have to do as a product team is, is change a configuration file and then we effectively ingest that as part of the DAG when it runs in Airflow. And it, so you, we ask product teams to define engagement with their product. So if if you, if if a customer is active on these areas of the product, as uh, then then that counts as engagement. This counts as contribution. This counts as acquisition. That kind of thing. And and then if they do that, they get all these free sort of free dashboards um, that are built every night. And so I think our general tactic is to try and encourage people to do the right thing by building them good tools that if they just follow the playbook, then they're going to get, you know, they get carrots. Um, I think, uh, but more and more, I think the expectation is that a product manager can talk about their product, can talk about how many users they have, can make intelligent comments about, you know, users that are being particularly successful and those less so. And, and so I think the sort of the culture of being being able to reason with data is 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 much much stronger at GitHub today than it was, let's say, five years ago. So I think you're being very nice when you're saying it sounds like we have a very strong data culture. I think we're growing a stronger data culture. I think traditionally, you know, observability has been amazing at GitHub, like the whole kind of chat up stuff and the ability to really manage a service from a chat channel was you know foundational in github's engineering culture and that's a decade old github's been doing that forever let's do spend a couple of minutes on, on on the observability uh even though it's a decade old uh tell us a little bit more about that i don't know i can tell you some um <laughs> so we don't own that but i know we use services like sentry uh splunk that kind of thing those are services i know about um i know we are moving towards open telemetry um so for logs and metrics that kind of thing i actually yeah i caught that on your engineering blog uh, yeah there was a nice post about that recently um i think one thing i would say though is that we you know, we have a divide in the way that we think about that data, which is not good, which is observability is like an engineering problem and like, you know, metrics and instrumentation is a product thing. And in some sense, those data, it doesn't make sense to think of those as separate data streams. Um, you know, a product manager can build a dashboard from logs if they wanted to, but they traditionally haven't. This is a great point, actually. We see that a lot, like you know, engineering needs data to figure out how to build something. And product needs data to figure out what to build. And when they collide, it's usually sparks you know, in the air because each side just looks on its own need. And, and can't. Re it's really hard to understand the other side. So engineering will say, we can't wait for a full-fledged data warehouse. And we can't wait for this data pipeline. And we need it now, now, now. And product will say, well, we've figured out most of the stuff on how to do it. Let's figure out what to do. I think uh, we're entering this uh, kind of era where, as you said, those two parts will eventually converge into one uh, big stream where everyone can can take uh, their part. But it's interesting to see that. We see it all the time, even internally at Firebolt, like there is a race to space around engineering versus product who can build a, a, a better system. So until uh, we get to that, uh, you know, end game, Kim, tell us everything. Tell us about everything you hate about product at uh, at, uh, at GitHub. Come on, imagine Arvon is not here, and you know your wish list. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't have a lot of strong opinion. Um, so you all you hear from me is like micro things that I deal with day to day, um, <laughs> like using commercial products. We have to deal with throttling. We have to architect our service around the service um, throttling when they handle the high volume of data that we have. Or using open source, we have to deal with upgrading when the open source projects is being developed um, mm -hmm. or having, or if the open source that we're using is no longer being supported, now we have to look for a different um, a different solution. So, so yeah, those are just micro things that we have to deal with day to day. And that 
not even include um, Python dependency management. <laughs> so that's <laughs> my absolutely nice. You managed a big list of, of things that easily go into the most horrible grunt work. So what's, what's the worst grunt work in your day-to-day -day job that you wish uh, could magically disappear? It would be um, Python dependency <laughs> again. Uh, not waking up in the morning and figure out something broken because of uh, transient, transient, transient dependency that we did not pin the version on. Say no to Python. Just kidding. Um, I've been using Python for a while and it has been the single thing that I've been complaining about Python over and over again. <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship, I guess. Yeah. Tell us about, uh, you know, a great uh, win from sort of the last year, something that you're proud of or had a good experience with? I would say the backfield tools for, for Airflow. So Airflow is very great with managing uh, workflow, but they they don't build backfield at um, an operation that people do normally, um, that people do day to day. Um, and at GitHub, we have so many people writing DAC, writing workflow, shaping their data. and the data can change, like schema change, or um, their metric needs to be updated, their calculation needs to be updated. There's more factor that they learn about and want to have a more accurate model. Um, things like that that require backfield rerunning the whole workflow over a long period of time could be years of data. And um, that flow doesn't have a good uh, story around that. So we have to build in our own tool uh, tooling to allow user to use backfill or to run backfill on Airflow easy, easily. I'm reaching out to um, the open source projects and hopefully that um, in the new um, versions of Airflow, I would engage more in that and help uh, share our learning and share our use case and hopefully shape um, the new backfill tools in, in Airflow. Awesome. Super interesting. Uh, but stop bragging. Now tell us about the failure. <laughs> what didn't work so well? What uh, can you warn others about or sort of a lesson learned? This is the top one. And I said, um, it's more like a Michael failure for me. Like every every single time um, we work on something, I want to reevaluate um, week by week or quarter by quarter. Um, thing that doesn't work. Well, for us, would be um, um, just integration between different parties that we're not familiar with. Like, with, like we're using Scoop and um, integrations where the task was not a, a very smooth transit integrations because um, Scoop required transactional um, read and to be able to read a lot of data to be tasked you have to issue query that doesn't have transaction boundary. So that transaction is not great. I wouldn't call it a failure, but it, it, it was um, kind of a difficult project to work on when the test is still developing and we need things to be moved to the test and we need things to still work on Scoop. Um, I'm not sure if I explained that very well, but yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully it gives you a picture of the yeah. struggle that we have day to day. For, for sure. I didn't ask Arvon about the failure because, you know, he's from product. Product are never are never wrong. No failures. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I was going to say one thing. Um, I think we, uh, I'll give you a success and then I'll give you a quick failure because I, I, I do want to tell you about one thing we did. This 4 billion event per day stream that we have. Um, one thing I think we've done that's really good is we've managed to use this common data source. So that 4 billion per day event stream is actually the log of every request to the Rails application, the GitHub like monolith. Um, so it's effectively the Rails log. Um, uh, so every every request, so it was about four and a bit billion per day. Um, and we've managed to sort of figure out how to derive majority of our company core metrics. So things like you know monthly engaged users, you know, top level business things that attract by the leadership team and Microsoft and using this event stream and lots of all of, well, the majority of all the, the individual product areas. So they use this sort of common data source, which felt 
really, really good to have this common way of approaching metric definitions. Um, that felt like it was very fragmented beforehand. And so that felt particularly good. Uh, it was very satisfying to sort of be able to sort of see them rolling up to some sort of total number. So that, that that's, uh, that, I'd say that was a big success in terms of trying to take a sort of rational approach to thinking about metrics across the awesome. business. Any special tips? I mean, as, as the experts in everything get, Are, is there any unique way in which you approach all the data projects from a Git perspective? Something uh, all, the reg all the regular Git users can, can uh, learn from? I have one suggestion. It's not really about Git. It's more about process, which is, um, I think, um, I appreciate the ADR format. I don't know if you know that. Uh, is it architectural decision what's record? Is that what Thank it stands you. for? I don't. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I do enjoy, and this is, you know, GitHub uses the product extensively still. So the idea is you can just go and browse any team, what they're working on. But there's this folder with all the ADRs in now, which is really lovely. So if you're trying to understand, like, why is this service built this way? Like, what, mm -hmm. what, what decision making process did we go through? There's usually an ADR. If it was a big decision for a team, there's a thing you can go and read and it's reasoned. And what else did we consider? I like that a lot. Who owns the ADR? Is it engine like who in engineering? Or? Usually, usually the sort of principal engineer responsible for building, you know, the decision maker. But it's you know the fact that it's in the repository means it's been through an extensive review. Um, you can go look at the pull request associated awesome. with that review, and often there's way, you know yeah. You know. Is that somehow related to the change in how kind of you know how we are working together in a distributed way where time zones are different, people are moving across places? So getting to those basic disciplines suddenly becomes a necessity uh, because you just can't hop into a room and just you know wrap it up uh, quickly. I think it you know it's huge and small companies. Uh, if you want to work with a distributed workforce with engineers, especially uh, those are those advices are gold. I think you know, we should definitely look into it ourselves. I mean, we've been scaling and struggling with remote uh, culture and, and you know, collaborative decision making in a remote way is, is, is very, it's not as easy as it sounds. So super, yeah, thanks. Okay, now, you know, we're reaching. Uh, it's almost over, almost. Now it's uh, the, the advice corner, anything sort of inspirational or, or who to follow, what can you sort of uh, give back to the community? in terms of what to look out for, who to follow, things like that. Any last famous words from the data people at, at GitHub? I guess a company that, well, a set of technologies that really inspire me is the Jupyter project. So this is um, Jupyter Notebooks is, you know, one of the things that they do. I think that this is a project that came out of the, uh, what was it, IPython originally, the sort of scientific Python ecosystem. I just think they've built a really compelling set of technologies cross-platform, cross, um, you know, cross-language, um, sort of the de facto way to sort of work as a data scientist today. And, and, and the way that the project runs is really incredible as well. So they've got really, really it sort of enlightened approach to governance and participation and stuff. So I think, um, so yeah, I think Jupyter is, you know, sort of an exemplar for how I think really good open source projects can be run. And of course, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of tool chain is, You know, adopted by all the cloud vendors, you know, the SageMaker, there's um, Azure Notebooks, there's Google Collaboratory, they're all using the same thing, right? That just seems amazing to me. And I think they're, uh, you know, they're, that's, a, that's a great project. I, I think they're doing great work. Let's all be a little bit more Jupiter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Kim, any, any last words? Open source or commercial? <laughs> Sorry, I can walk through. Uh, Japan, you heard me. I'm a little bit um, skeptical on, on either one in terms of whether or not I use it yet. So I want to get my hand on before I recommend. AWS or Azure? Azure. Azure. Work from home or from the office? Work from home. <laughs> Bit of both. Yeah. Okay, that's been awesome. Uh, Arvon, Kim, thank you so much for, for joining us. It's thank been you. super interesting. And we'll see you around. Yeah, yeah thank cool. you. For Thanks us. for the time. Thank you. Thanks. Our pleasure.